Welcome back. I am at the previous property where we were renting and we are going to go through a neglected garden and see what it looks like and how it is doing. This is going to look amazing and it's going to be really exciting. I'm absolutely sure. So before anything else happens, we should roll the fountain. I've talked a lot before about planting the plants that thrive with your climate rather than trying to adjust things to your climate, right? So if you live in a tropical climate, trying to grow temperate crops is not always easy. And if you live in a temperate climate, trying to grow plants that are adapted to long, warm, hot, humid seasons doesn't go so well. So what we have here as we begin this walk are yams from the tropics. Right now it's in the 90s every day. It's wet. This is the time that poor temperate climate vegetables are absolutely covered in stink bugs, rotting, falling into the ground, not getting pollinated. Everything is eating and destroying them. But look at this greenery. This is sand right here. This was literally a sand pile that we spread out like construction sand that was dumped here. We spread it out and I put some cow manure underneath it and here we go. We've got tropical vegetables. Look at this. This is hibiscus aceticella, the cranberry hibiscus, a very good salad green and it's way taller than me. It should have been cut. It's like doubled in size and this has been neglected for the last month. You can see there's weeds in here, but it's growing like crazy. The ground is patchy. Even the weeds are not as happy as these plants because these are exactly awesomely adapted and they're just running. Look at this cassava. Cassava taller than me. These are our test cassava beds that I did here. I've got about 10 different varieties we're testing to see which ones get through the winter and will actually produce roots before it gets cold. Which ones carry through, which ones produce roots before it gets cold and actually make a good yield for this area. This is lower Alabama. This is not the tropics tropics, but we have this really nasty, long, hot, rainy, humid season and plants that are adapted to the tropics do really, really well here through this season when everything else is kicking off. Longevity spinach down here. Actually, no, this is Okinawa spinach. Purple leaves underneath tell you this is Okinawa spinach. It's related. This is Gynura bicolor. And over here is the longevity spinach. It's cousin Gynura procumbens, which is a really good tropical green. These will die when it freezes. So I always take some cuttings and put them in pots and plant them back out again. But look at, where's the pest damage? Where's the mold? It's growing like crazy. This is, these are salad greens. You can't grow lettuces right now very easily at all unless you had a high tunnel and maybe an air conditioner unit in it. But this is totally beautiful, looking really good. And it's been neglected. We started moving out of here the beginning of July. So we're at about a month and a half of doing nothing in the garden. Let's go on through. Cassava. Cody Cove Farm. Look up Cody Cove Farm. Got a few varieties from Josh Jameson, brilliant man. And we're testing them. We're going to see what happens. And I've totally lost track of which variety is which. All I care about is are they going to make big roots or not? And if they do, I will duplicate them. Coming back here, this is the lasagna garden. Remember our soil is really, really horrible. We stacked up layers. I have a whole video on it. We stacked up layers and planted it. So in here we've got yams that are escaping from somewhere. And we have, I don't even know what even is this? Oh, this is Yakon. And then we have Jerusalem artichokes that are looking really, really good. Very surprising how nice everything looks, but it's not surprising if you've done lasagna gardening before because there's a lot of life in it. And right here we have some rare peppers that I can't even remember what they are, but they look really incredible. And hot peppers 
If you have not grown peppers before, hot peppers go right through the summer heat and don't mind it nearly as much as sweet peppers. You try to grow bell peppers or larger peppers, they don't do very well, but the smaller the pepper, usually the better they go through. And the hotter the pepper, it seems like they just go through better. These are gorgeous. And they're super, super spicy. I am not gonna eat one on camera this time. That's not a good idea. Right here, I'm stepping over Kakuza squash, which is a member of the greater squash family. It's a Lagenaria. Lagenaria cicera, if I remember correctly. Birdhouse gourd. It is a cultivar of the same species that makes really, really long, long fruits that stand in for a vegetable that starts with Z that is so nasty. I don't mention it on this channel. We're not going to talk about it. This is a similar, you know, if you're going to eat something like that thing, this is way better. I will actually eat these. They're very good. Come on down here so we can see through the yams. These are on the trellises to make you jealouses. Josh Satin's design. If you don't follow Josh Satin, I highly recommend following Josh Satin's channel. He's a very smart guy. He's got a, uh, a camera channel and he's got a channel on farming. And this was his trellis design. They've worked really well for the yams. They're sagging a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. Yams really pull on stuff. We are growing about uh, eight to 10 different varieties of yams testing different types. We've got prickly yams, we've got Dioscoria alata, we have Dioscoria bulbifera, we've got Dioscoria polystachia, we've got uh, Dioscoria rotundifolia, Dioscoria cayenensis, and various types inside of their yellows and whites and purples. And we're just seeing what does well here and which ones carry through and make us good roots. These are also a tropical. They do incredibly. They're not getting chewed up. Huge amount of calories in the ground. If you live down where it's hot and humid, zone eight, nine, 10, 11, this is your stand-in for a white potato. It's a great starch crop, and it's a good survival crop. Very, very easy to grow. And just so long as it has something to climb on. It makes a big starchy root. So down here you can see there's more of them looking incredible. The folks that we were renting from here said that they don't mind at all if we come back and harvest later. So we're just leaving them alone until the end of the season. We've got to wait until about Christmas to harvest them. It takes a long time to make those big roots. They're starting to make some bull bills right here. We want these too. I want bull bills for our planting material. This is how you replant some of the varieties. Other varieties do not make bulbils. These are aerial roots. Some of them do not make aerial roots and you have to cut up the roots and plant them that you actually dig from beneath the ground. But the aerial roots act kind of like seeds. If you come around to this side over here, you can see this area was where we had our annuals, our tomatoes and carrots and all that. And pretty much the last thing standing are a few plants that are in bloom. The mint, the chocolate mint on the ground here is doing fantastic. I dumped a whole barrel of Dave's Fetid Swamp Water over here when we moved. And obviously it went crazy over it. And it's just like, it, it's like it washed the mint sideways and it just exploded around the area that I poured it. I dumped it like all the slop right here and it looks like it burned it back some and then it's regrowing into it and going insanely sideways. But the the things that are really lasting right now, I see a couple of sick looking collards and there are some ochres in here that are doing okay. But you gotta remember the soil is all really, really horrible and the ones that are doing well are the ones that are adapted to the tropics. Like these velvet beans right here which self-seeded after last year. And then back here in the corner, these big Moringa trees. Those are doing great. And okras. I mixed a whole bunch of different okra varieties together and planted them so I can kind of do a land race okra. And that's where we did it. So now I want to show you my favorite part of the gardens and the part that's doing really, really incredibly well. Let's go. Grocery Row Gardens. Look at all that crazy greenery. It's a big mix of mess. Now I was here 
yesterday getting a beehive set and uh, starting to get them moved and I came through here and we harvested four or five huge Kakuza squash right through the middle here but unfortunately I don't I, I, I harvested them already they're actually dinner tonight so let's come on through here pomegranate a wild mint that I just let grow I've got some ragweed we got all kinds of various stuff coming through here more okras these I'm just letting go to seed part of the okra land race I planted them all over the place ginger at the base of this plum this plum was cut down to here this plum was cut down to here two months ago wants to go crazy don't be afraid to prune okra and on the ground you notice that the pathways are covered the ground cover is a combination of sweet potatoes and watermelons they grow really nicely underneath the canopy of the taller stuff there's an entire orchard pattern in here in these grocery row gardens if you don't have the grocery row gardening book I show you how to do all of it in the book it's very cheap nine dollars and ninety nine cents and it shows how I laid out this garden but you, it's a food forest that's under control so there is an orchard with shrubbery in between and with edibles and medicinals and insectary plants and then there are ground covers so right now in this season the ground covers I like are melons and sweet potatoes and the sweet potatoes still got to grow we've got to harvest them they are not ready yet there's a sun hemp that escaped into here I threw a few hunt sun hemp seeds around look at them that's a nitrogen fixer right there those can get chopped and fed into the system cassava Tithonia diversifolia a perennial sunflower that is one of my very favorite chop and drop plants as well as being great for making a quick privacy screen it is probably not something you're gonna be able to grow past maybe zone 7 unless you protected it really really well but here zone 8 and south it is a really great perennial duplicates from cuttings my daughter sometimes has them in her seed store cuttings she's had some this week this plum we planted this last spring look at how big and beautiful it is now the soil that's in here doesn't look like the soil that's in the rest of the yard because the soil in here has been amended and we put in a lot of biochar we put in steve solomon's nutrient mix we have mulched it repeatedly we've dumped chicken run compost in here so everything in here is greener and much happier we're still fighting leaching we're still fighting geology this is still a nasty grit but it will revert to that if we don't keep feeding it so one of the purposes of having all these plants on here is to have all that root mass in the ground feeding the ground plus we get the chop and drop chop it and drop it and chop it and drop it so there's constantly organic matter rotting into the system and we're going to recreate this system over at the new place there's a little okra I like the little ones they're really nice look at this jungle you wouldn't guess it these beds are four foot wide and these these are these pathways are three foot Three foot pathways. I don't even know some of the stuff that's growing in here now. We threw so many seeds around and the weeds are starting to move into it. Ideally, the system would have been weeded multiple times, but we were not under ideal situation. So this is what it is. And if we wanted to, we could just come right through here. I think that's Egyptian spinach. I just found some and just ate it. I, th I think that's what it is. Otherwise, if I start hallucinating, hopefully it happens off camera. Ideally, what we would do is through the summer, we come out every couple of weeks and we yank a few weeds and often we just chop the weeds and we mulch over them with more mulch. But there's tons of stuff growing in here without much care. There are Everglades tomatoes growing down here, which are delicious. One of the few tomatoes that goes right through the heat. My daughter sells these in her seed store too. This is how you plant them. You spit a few seeds out, just like that. And 
they self seed. You don't even have to, but if you're walking around the yard with a handful of them, you can just squeeze them wherever you want to, and they usually seed and come back. There's a moringa tree right here. I cut a huge piece of this one off yesterday. It was about 10 feet tall. I cut the center of it out, took it home to make tea. I actually made soup, put the leaves in bone broth, and heated it up to a rolling boil, and then I broke three eggs into it and stirred it up and made an egg soup. Bone broth, moringa, and eggs. Super good for you. The pathways are getting filled up here with all of the melons and sweet potatoes which I love to see but we didn't actually plant them in the pads we just planted up to the pads and they were just like along the edges and they crawl through here and fill it which also builds the soil up stops erosion keeps a cover on top of the ground keeps it cool increases the organic matter content it's fantastic works really really well to have a ground cover on there as you come up here can you see these these crazy things. These are Dioscoria polystachya. And these are in their second year. They make massive amounts of bull bills, which you can cook like little tiny potatoes, skin and all. Serve them with butter and garlic. Eric Tonsmeyer calls them yam berries and writes about them in his, his very good book, Paradise Lot, which is about taking a little rundown duplex in Hollyoak, Massachusetts, and turning it into an absolute garden of food, an urban oasis of life organically. It's, it's a good story, and it's fascinating. We have a couple of dedicated people just attacking something like that. But you could just take these and fill a bowl full of them, and you've got a good starch for a side. Or even your main dish if you pick enough of them. They're also super, super invasive, which means that they're very, very easy to grow. Chinese yam. We're not gonna talk about it anymore. As a matter of fact, we should just probably edit this entire portion out. We're not gonna talk about it. Definitely don't plant it. It's, it's not like it's a super, super easy to grow food. That also makes huge roots beneath the ground. Definitely, definitely don't plant it. These cannas here we use for chop and drop. They're also very pretty. This is a variegated variety. Let's walk on through here because there is something I have to show you that I have spotted from the other row. Here's more Dioscoria polystachya. I also planted a few seeds for the Kakaza not that long ago. Uh, a month and a half ago. Here we go. There is a Kakuza squash. This one's probably still good to eat. These are fantastic. We're gonna save a lot of the rest of them for seeds. They make a big, long, woody, they can get like this, like this. Great big, long fruit that turns woody, just like it's, uh, of the other cultivar for birdhouse gourds and then you can smash it open and take the seeds out of it or cut it open and scrape the seeds out of it and make utensils out of it I don't know like a gigantic straw or something or a, or a big weird hollow pipe you could do things with them baseball bats look at this one see how big that is that's incredible I love them but we just planted a few seeds in here and I didn't know if they would grow or not because I was ignoring them. But that's not what I was going to show you. This is what you have to see here. This is something I'm very, very excited about. This, oh, man, this Jerusalem artichoke is going to cover this completely. Can you get past this? You may not be able to even see back there. Up here on this trellis is the incredibly rare edible Dioscoria bulbifera. That is one of the bulbils. It's a weird angular large bulbil. This is not ready yet. There's a few more over here. This one is a prize winner though. That one's going to be gigantic. You could peel them and cook them like potatoes. Unlike the regular Dioscoria 
Bulbifera, which has toxic bulbils, these are edible when they're cooked. And it's like potatoes that you pick out of the air. So if you have a trellis and you let them grow on it, you get these very, very pretty, pretty leaves, very tropical. And they grow and they make all these bulbils, which are edible. And they have almost no pest issues, except now in the state of Florida where they have released a beetle that kills the wild forms of it, those will come and kill these. It's very unfortunate. Up here we don't have the beetle. They'll chew the living daylights out of the leaves. So up until they started doing that beetle release program, it was like the perfect staple crop. But they started releasing the beetles to get rid of the poisonous ones, and yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad, because this could have been an excellent staple crop for Florida. Now, if you're along the Gulf Coast where they haven't released the beetle, you're in good shape. And there may be a wetty controlled beetle too. Here's a beautiful persimmon. This persimmon has grown four feet this year. You can see the growth started here and has come all the way up. All that bright reddish orange growth going upwards. You can see that the cassava loves the grocery row gardens too. It doesn't cast so much shade that it stops the vines from growing underneath. Um, that's a wonderful thing about doing this in an area with so much sunshine. If you were farther north, you might want to arrange your beds so you get maximum sunlight through them. Here we don't even want maximum sunlight through them because full sun in lower Alabama is a lot of sun. We've got yacons growing in between thornless blackberries and raspberries. Lots of weeds. There's some hazelnuts hiding in here too. I don't even know if we can walk through this section. Some of these, some of these actually have closed up and they need to have a machete run through them. Mexican tree spinach. Here's another green going right through the heat. All your greens of spring are gone. Mexican tree spinach has taken over. This came back from the ground after the freezes. It's a nutritious green. You gotta cook it for 20 minutes. And it's, it's very hearty, delicious. These are the biomass cannas that I love. Some bug has gotten into it, I don't care. We chop and drop these regularly. These need to be cut to the ground again. My daughter is going to dig a bunch of these up and put them in her Etsy store. This is Canna musifolia. It grows very fast. You can cut it again and again for mulch. I love it. Wow, there's a Mexican tree spinach here that is taller than I am. A little side branch. And it's, it's way up over my head by good six inches or so. That's a lot of growth considering it froze all the way down to the ground. That has been massive and you can cut and eat these shoots too. You probably can't see it from back there. It's growing right next to this apple tree and it's it's up there. Look at that. It needs to have the cannas around it cut so it can breathe. One of the great things about having a mixed ecosystem like this is even if something doesn't do great something else will fill in. I mean, just the, the sheer amount of root crops in here, we've got Chinese yam, we've got yacon, we've got cassava, we have taro. We can eat the cannas if we want to. Planted some cold hardy banana. Let's go on through this area since we can actually pass through here. Hey, are these cannas gonna be for sale? Yeah. <laughs> You're selling these cannas? Yep. Will they be uh, listed online? Indeed they will. So these roots here, these are what Daisy sells in her nursery. These are the biomass cannas. You put this thing in the ground and it will make a whole clump for you by the next year and you can just cut it and chop it and drop it. We plant them around all of our fruit trees. They are fantastic. Really a useful plant. Daisy also sells seeds for these marigolds. These are a mixed up, they're becoming a land race marigold because we planted a whole ton of different varieties and then they're just crossing and self seeding and we just let them come back. I mean this whole area needs to be 
whacked through here and thrown back as mulch because they're so vigorous. They'll grow all the way from the spring through and they self seed. We have some turmeric in here. That's looking pretty good. The uh, asparagus is looking pretty good. It likes it earlier in the year, but it comes back in a big amount. This is a apricot, which is not really supposed to grow here. It looks pretty good. It actually has uh, hot peppers growing through it. It's a hot pepper all the way up here. The rest of that, the pepper just kind of leaned its way in there. This is galangal. It has a incredible aroma, kind of like, uh, smells like frangipani. If you know the frangipani tree, that's what it smells like. It smells incredible. This is a really great ginger and it grows well here too. This one is on its second year and it's the clump is starting to spread, which is really cool. This was part of our corn project. I uh, harvested the ears off of these already, just letting a whole bunch of different varieties of corn cross. Big right here, that looks amazing. It definitely needs to be pruned back repeatedly because it will eat this entire area. It's part of the fun, chopping it up and throwing it on the ground or using some of the prunings to get cuttings that you can share with other people. I'm always starting stuff whether or not I think I need it or not and then giving it away, which is kind of fun. This is Dioscoria pentaphylla from uh, Derek's nursery. Dioscoria pentaphylla is a really slow grower compared to the other yams. I'm hoping that it makes me some bulbils before the end of the year. It's probably more of a tropical. And there's some arrowroot growing in between right there. This is a second year turmeric. And then this is an apple we are training to go sideways. See how it's been pulled sideways to the ground like that. And it's got long leaders going like that. I like the idea of an apple going right through the middle of the bed. Wow, some of these Cosmos are crazy. I threw mixed Cosmo seeds all over the place because the butterflies like them and I like to look at them. We have some of Ezekiel's land race watermelons going through here. I took some of his mixed seeds, some of which had self-seeded here and there around the yard and then grown again. And so we saved some of those seeds and then we saved some from the ones that he grew deliberately and crossed last year. Plus he mixed in other varieties. So we don't even have an idea what a lot of them are. We're trying to mix as many genetics as possible. So there's a little watermelon growing right here in the pathway. I harvested a couple of them yesterday and they were orange. Orange watermelons, sweet orange watermelons about this big that required no care other than sticking the seeds in the ground. I'm just letting them run. That's pretty cool. I don't know what colors we're gonna end up with in the final mix because they're all just crossing and crossing. A little more Dioscoria pentaphylla through here. Also not really growing super fast, but this one looks like it might generate some bull bills soon. Looks like there's a couple of little side shoots here that might do it. It looks very different from the other yams. You see where it gets the name Pentaphylla for the five lobed leaves. It's really pretty. That is so neat. There's so much variation just inside of the genus. It's exciting. Got some big elephant ears here. I planted all kinds of edibles in here. Obviously. <laughs> Look at this. This peach. I cut this peach. Down. Look, you pull your sock up like this. Cut your peach tree right about there. That's it. Or at your knee if you're feeling like you really are scared. Look at that. Grows right back. Peaches are like monsters. They thrive on pruning. We've got, I see another watermelon down here, and we've got mulberries. Mulberry much taller than I am, right through, right in the middle. This is my mulberry row. 
There are Rosa rugosas. This is the rose that makes rose hips. It is a thorny rose, but it makes these pretty little simple flowers. There's not any real good ones on here. That's a spent flower right now. But they make the nice big fruits where you can get vitamin C. The benefits of rose hips. Trees everywhere. Somewhere in here, I think I even have a, uh, yeah, there's some goji berry. These are goji berries that are getting run over by other stuff. Goji berry likes an alkaline soil. I planted them in here anyways, knowing it's very acid and they haven't died yet, which is a good sign. They're not dead. That's what you wanna look for first in your plants. Is it dead? No. Okay, good. This one is really dangerous. This thing needs to be pruned or to have a cage around it. This is the Mysore raspberry, which is a tropical raspberry. Super thorny. Stay there. Stay. Super thorny with very white cane. It's very pretty. And it makes a dark black raspberry fruit. This is one we're testing for this area to see. I've had varieties of it that were very bland and I'm hoping those are not bland. More yams here. There's a coppiced oak that I planted yams on. They, they love it. Giant cosmos right here. Some self-seeded zinnias. Comfrey is getting to be toast at this time of year. It hates this weather. You can see how much it's rotted. Earlier in the year, it looked great. Now it looks terrible, but that's okay because it's feeding this Rachel Mulberry. As those leaves fall and rot, the Rachel Mulberry is thriving on it. These Rachel Mulberries you can get at Scrubland Farms Nursery in North Central Florida. Scrubland Farms with a Z on the end of farm. My friend Sam propagates the Rachel Mulberry. It's got a really cool story. I named it after my wife. And then here is a white mulberry down here at the end. And that is the end of the grocery row garden system. And I'm gonna stand over here and talk like, like this because then you can see it in the background and it looks really cool. And we have a very, very professional YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me. This is the Grocery Row Gardens and they are doing great, huge mix of species. I called it Grocery Row Gardening after an idea I got from Stefan Subkowiak, another guy you should be subscribed to, where he talked about going through his orchard like you're going through a grocery store. And I thought, what a great idea. What if we could make this sort of thing in a backyard scale? And that's what we did. We've got these beautiful rows that are controllable with a machete or whatever you have. If you don't like a machete, you could use a chainsaw, something appropriate, appropriate technology, respectful technology. And you go through and you just clean the pathways. And as the summer season dies down and everything starts freezing back and every later, later in the year, it gets really, really easy to control. You've just got sticks with little clumps of brown plants here and there. And you just go and you remulch and you clean all the junk out of the rows and throw it back onto the beds and let it rot down and protect the beds over the course of the winter. You could do this in a cold climate. You could do this in the deep tropics, but it's like going shopping in your backyard. You'll have fruit up here. You've got berries and medicinals down here in the middle. You've got asparagus and you've got flowers for the pollinators and gingers for upset stomachs and for cooking tons and tons of food and it's like you could just take a shopping cart through here and throw in a few roots and throw in a few vegetables and throw in a few fruits and go cook dinner from your backyard just like shopping in your backyard this is my outdoor pantry i'm going to be rebuilding this system on the new property. If you want to learn more about the system, check out Grocery Row Gardening. I'll put a link to the booklet before. I'm looking for people to experiment and try this in different climates and it works. It's based on a whole bunch of different data and systems from around the world and I absolutely love it. I love the food forest under control. The power of a forest's edge with all of the groceries that you could ever want. So check it out, Grocery Row Gardening. And thank you for joining me you're gonna watch me rebuild one of these from scratch at the new property, which we actually own. So stay tuned, subscribe, and until next time, may your thumbs 
always be green. 